it's good. So um, are we live now? <laughs> okay. Okay, I want to share. All right, let's begin. Okay, so. Hello, uh, let, me, uh, let me check on uh, YouTube. Are we good? Cool. All right. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, our FAP meetup online about uh, immersive distance learning with VR, AR, MR. And um, this event is hosted by Loftwork and FAP Cafe. Um, allow me to uh, spend a few minutes uh, to introduce who we are. Uh, Loftwork is a design and creative company for explorers. Oh, sorry, I'm going to share the screens for, sorry. Oops, technical difficulty. Okay. Ta -da. Ta -da. It's okay. Is that good? Okay. All right, so again, okay, so again, allow me to uh, spend a few minutes to introduce um, who we are. Um, this event is hosted by Loftwork and Fab Cafe. So Loftwork is a design and creative company for explorers. Everything we do, we challenge the status quo and we believe innovation starts from uh, exploring the unknown. And we don't like to do things alone. So we work with uh, collaborators um, to come up with new ideas, new design, uh, new products and new services. We have, uh, we have a huge network of collaborators. We work with companies and government on creative projects and often integrates um, spatial design, digital design and service design. Our collaborators comes from a community called uh, Fat Cafe. So Fab Cafe was founded in 2012 um, by Loftwork, first started in Tokyo. It was a, well, it is still a uh, digital fabrication cafe. The idea is to combine uh, the cafe culture and the maker culture. So we are equipped with uh, digital fabrication machines such as laser cutters and, and 3D printers. And um, besides uh, digital fabrication, we are actually a, a community of creators. So we often host um, different kinds of events to build um, uh, a creative community. So by community, we, 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 um, uh, we're actually thinking of, we're actually looking at a, a, a different uh, disciplines. So uh, a bio club, for instance, and we have a old fashioned design lab, which is focusing on the design of smells. And we have this um, UFAP, award community, which is uh, focusing on design and technology. And we also have um, a community that is um, more focused on sustainable development. And we will host a Global Ghost Jams uh, every year in September. And of course, um, we have a VR community and you can see the pictures on your right. It, it's an exhibition in uh, Taipei Fat Cafe. So um, our collaborators is now um, in many different cities. We have a fat cafe in Europe, we have one in Mexico, and then um, several in, in Asia, um, Taipei, Hong Kong. Um, there's a few in Japan. So today's events is actually um, uh, under uh, this, Future City campaign. So we started this campaign because of the current uh, coronavirus situation. We wanted to think forward. We wanted, we wanted to think um, uh, what happens when we all get out of, uh, of this pandemic. So um, the topic under uh, the Future City campaign, one of the topic is reshaping education. Because we think that this uh, pandemic would change the way we learn forever. So um, today's event is, uh, uh, it's an online FAT meetup and um, it's about um, immersive distance learning with VR technology. And, and going along with this meetup, we actually 
uh, hosting a online um, innovative game design challenge. So if you're interested to join, um, please um, click on the link in the YouTube page. You can join this um, game design challenge. So uh, we have invited a, a few um, uh, very high profile jury. And, uh, and then there's actually a price if you win. And all the work, uh, the winning work will be also documented on this award.com platform, which is also created by Loveworks. So that's about it. Let's, um, let me introduce today's uh, speaker. And uh, we are very delighted to have um, Andrea. Um, she's an architect and the CEO of uh, Numena, a, a German-based company that creates physical and virtual spaces. And to get, together with Kyle, he's an interaction designer and also a professor of intermedia at Parsons School of Design. So they both have um, extensive experience in virtual reality. And I'm sure today's sharing and conversation will be very fruitful and inspiring. So Andrea, Kyle, welcome. So in the next 30 minutes, uh, both speakers will have a sharing session and then we will have a panel discussion and also a Q and A from online audience. So if you have questions, you can uh, type it uh, on the chat. We will uh, we'll try to answer all of them if time allows. So you ready? So let's begin. And Andrea, please um, take the stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, Harvey, thank you so much for the invitation. I, I'm looking forward to the discussion today. I also have to say that I'm a little bit in love with Fab Cafe and the idea of it and how you're trying to implement it. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. As Harvey said, um, I run a company that develops virtual reality applications and other type of immersive software, as well as um, real architecture projects. Um, today, I'm gonna focus more on the software development side of our company. And I'm gonna have a very short presentation that's gonna quickly cover a very wide array of topics. Um, but I wanna keep it short so that we have time to go into a conversation. So if, if anything I say um, stirs questions in your mind or you would like more detail, then please write it down and I'll be happy to get into that um, afterwards. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so this is our office. We are located in the south of Germany, close to the Swiss border. Um, we are actually in a shoe factory that is now empty because they relocated the entire production from Germany to Eastern Europe. Um, and then, you know, slowly tech companies are starting to be attracted to these um, now useless but quite attractive big empty spaces with tall ceilings. Um, we have um, several clients that are part of the big um, German industry companies like BMW. B. Brown is also one of our um, clients and we work with them on several projects. They are a multinational that develops um, medical products and surgical instruments. Uh, we are a very young company. We are two years old. Uh, we've been, however, very, very lucky to um, be able to get these clients, keep them, um, continue to work with them, and um, get a lot of international recognition for the work that we've been doing. Um, now, to jump really quickly into um, VR. Some of you may know this, but I want to put this out there for those of you that are not so familiar with uh, VR hardware, because this whole renaissance of VR, um, it, it's really triggered by 
certain innovations on the consumer market that have to do with VR hardware, because VR as a technology has existed for several decades. So in 2016, um, two virtual headsets hit the consumer market, the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. And these um, are still in use today. People still buy them. They're amazing products. Um, they have extremely high graphic quality and they both come with two controllers that have six degrees of freedom. This means you can keep the, you, each of your hands will have a joystick that you can move um, into three axes. So um, this is the difference between this high end products and things that you might have seen um, used sometimes like Cardboard and Oculus Go that come with, I don't know, controller or one controller with two degrees of freedom or one degree of freedom. Um, so these are the two products that kind of gave birth to this interest that we've been seeing um, that comes from big companies trying to somehow figure out how they can use VR for, for their own purposes. The disadvantages that come with these two headsets um, have to do with the fact that they require a very high-end gaming PC with a very expensive graphic card inside. They require sensors um, to be mounted in various locations around the room and a lot of IT support. So if they're looking at developing a learning program in VR using one of these headsets, any company or institution like a university has to account for the fact that um, unless we're dealing with a very technical oriented kind of student, um, you will need 24 hour IT support for someone to be able to use this equipment and troubleshoot it. And this is where a big, big, big breakthrough happened in 2019. Um, we got for the first time ever VR headsets that do not require any kind of computer to run high quality, um, programs and applications on them. And that come with six degree of freedom um, controllers. And why these six degree of freedom controllers are important because for learning and training, you, you often need to interact with virtual objects using your, your both, both of your hands. Otherwise, a lot of applications um, will just not be realizable in this medium. Um, so we are all seeing um, a huge increases, increases in interest coming from both enterprise and academic um, institutions in VR since um, these type of headsets have hit the market uh, last year. So why, why are people interested in VR for learning? Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this diagram. This is the cone of experience that is a fairly simplistic, but um, gets the point across in terms of what, how we categorize training. So um, many studies have shown that when people just read something or hear something or see something, they only retain very little of that information. So the more you create training programs that can involve more of your senses, um, the more would be ret uh, retained. So the idea is that we are still using um, lectures based on video and kind of storytelling to teach things that actually require a hands-on practical approach. Um, but we cannot afford to offer that to all students and entire classrooms. Um, now with VR, the hope is that we'll be able to introduce this lacking element and improve the amount of things students are able to retain and move them from the 30% range to the 80, 90% range. Um, VR, however, is not the solution for everything. A lot of things um, do not make sense um, in, in VR in terms of training solutions. So it's very good to understand um, when someone should turn towards VR. Like what kind of what kind of things are better taught in VR, and what kind of for what kind of things we better stick with the traditional video and and um, lecture format? So things that um, have many steps that have to be repeated in a particular order um, are perfect for VR. So you give a student an application, um, the student takes the headset home and can rehearse 
those steps as many times as they want until they get it. Um, it's also ideal for processes where there is a relationship between each step and the location of that action in an environment. So there are many study cases right now that have been successfully deployed of training scenarios for things like emergency rooms. So in an emergency room, when you are a doctor or a student in training, you have to learn how to react very fast. And each type of emergency has a series of steps that you need to, to know and implement extremely fast without thinking. And each of these steps requires that you go to a certain part of the room and pick up a certain things from. So you pick up a certain solution from a certain drawer, then you go in another room, pick up a certain type of instrument and do a particular thing with it. So it's very hard to practice that unless one, you have access to a, a practice room um, and or you are somehow um, an apprentice and you actually see and help the actual doctor. But until you get to that point, a lot of medical students just um, don't have very efficient ways to learn these things. Um, VR is also increasingly being used for things like soft skills, so psychological therapeutic training for issues such as fear of public speaking and stage fright. Um, also very, very important right now, just completely taking off in all the fields, is um, using VR for training that requires access to large equipment that is just too big or too expensive to be made available to all the people that have to be trained. So uh, companies like Boeing, for example, are completely rolling out VR training uh, programs right now because of course you can't give a airplane engine to every engineer that you have to train. And the two pictures on the right show some examples of this. So on the left um, is a screenshot from a storyboard from one of our applications and I'll show a little bit of a video clip from that later. And on the right is a um, soft skill training app done by another company. Um, there are particular things um, in the use of this, this technology that are very interesting for, for companies. So there is the um, notion of gamification, and this word has been thrown around lately. Um, but it's basically a way to make what can otherwise be a boring and tedious learning program seem a little bit more engaging. So in one of our examples, we have introduced points um, and a counter to make things feel a little bit more like a game. So every time you have to repeat the step to not only learn a little bit more, do it a little bit faster, but also get a little bit more points and more rewards. Um, there's a lot of type of um, data that if you are allowed to, you can uh, collect and track to prove um, certain kind of performance um, indexes and make feedback reports and uh, to just have some kind of metrics that will give you feedback as to whether or not um, this type of training was more efficient than perhaps other methods of training that you might also be experimenting with. Um, there are some very famous examples uh, where VR training has been rolled out with um, a lot of success. And two of these are Sodexo and Walmart. Um, and I would be happy to give more details about these. These are absolutely fascinating study cases. Um, and yes, I well, can give more feedback on this uh, later if someone is interested. But basically, where do you get the return on investment for such a thing? Because of course, VR development software is a particularly expensive type of software, software development. Um, so the, the basic tenant is that with VR, you can train faster, more efficiently, more people, and for more scenarios than, uh, than with other methods. It can also save travel costs if your application allows multiple people to meet inside virtual rooms live and collaborate that, that way rather than um, have several people fly around the world to, to physically meet each other. Um, you can have, um, you can do recordings and in-game video screenshots as many as you would like. And it's particularly interesting for certain uh, groups 
uh, like seniors and also children. So to wrap things up, uh, for those of you who are interested in how exactly these virtual applications are being produced, um, the basic steps are you take the, the CAD objects and most, most objects these days that are being somehow industrially produced um, are being generated from some kind of three-dimensional data. Then you bring that into the game engine of your choice um, based on the programming language of your choice. Actually, you only have two choices right now, um, Unity and Unreal Engine. And then the magic sauce of combining these 3D data with programming then produces um, your virtual reality application. And let me turn the sound down. This is, this is um, a little bit of fun we had with some of some 3D data we got from, from BMW for an application we did for them. Um, so this is to show you what you can do when you have all of this amazing kind of information. So here we got a kick out of animating each individual part of this motor. So this particular segment that I'm showing right now um, was used as an introductory VR experience um, for marketing. And what you are seeing here are about 5,000 individual pieces. Um, this is more the way a typical training thing looks like. These are some very simple basic steps that show you how to assemble a signal light. But this is kind of the idea that it's making it very, it's making people using this application um, very self-sufficient in reading the instructions and figuring out um, all the steps. And this is also a very short clip from a surgical simulator that we designed and developed. And of course, you can see things that are not optimal. For example, in real life, you would get some kind of um, physical resistance and feedback when your instrument touches any kind of bone that you don't have in VR, and there's some issues that come out of that. Um, but it is still allowing you to interactively rehearse uh, several steps that you would not be able to do using video. That is it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. That's a fantastic video. And thanks for giving us um, you know, an overview of what's uh, you know, the current VR um, scene, what's going on out there. Um, so I think uh, we can definitely chat more uh, after Kyle's um, sharing. So um, Kyle, please, um, the stage is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, one second, let me share. So looking at Andrea's slides got me all excited. The, the BMW one was so cool to look at. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so uh, uh, Fat Cafe, thanks for having me. We're no stranger. I, uh, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank you, Harvey, for having me. And I also want to give a shout out to Daiki in Tokyo. Uh, I hope you have enough toilet papers with you. Because um, that has been the subject we talk about lately. Um, so uh, I'm Kyle Lee. I uh, I start teaching at Parsons around two thousand, not around, started in two thousand eight. Um, I was fortunate to involve in some of the uh, education reform in the city, sort of to experiment uh, uh, game and learning uh, in the context of school. Uh, which I, by school, I mean public school. So uh, before I get into what's going on in the higher education, uh, I wanna start out with something that I have been doing um, um, in the beginning. Um, so most of, if you have ever worked in the industry, 
uh, in game and learning in America, you will probably, based on your research and work on this single quote, uh, and many other findings and research done by Sesame's workshop since 1960s. Um, and what, uh, among all those researches and results, this one kind of struck me the most. Um, I didn't know, I am um, big gamers. I play a lot of games. I learned to make games in school. And I have never really thinking about learning from a, you know, academic point of view or scholars point of view, or even as a professional practice. I was for fortunate to brought it into this industry. And one of the most important thing that I discovered is the single quote here. If you can hold the attention of a children or any audience, you can educate them. Um, and when I, when I was working on this installation, so I'll give a little bit of the background. In 2008, I was invited to be on board of this project called Quest to Learn, where uh, we built a middle school in New York City entirely from the ground up. Um, to these to redesign all the curriculums to to redesign all the subjects with game design or even new media theories in general so um this is one of the installation we have at uh, at the quest to learn middle school um when i set up for the first day the principal sent in a few kids to help me and um i have one computer that hook up to two monitors so I had this moment where I moved the cursor from the left computer to the right computer, and I heard all the kids standing behind me was like, wow, how did that happen, right? And for the next 15 minutes, they were standing behind me and listening to me explaining what's going on um, because they have never seen something like this before. And I think that moment kind of uh, inspired me that technology and new media has a way with learners or um, they they create motivations and they create curiosity uh, in the audience that we're, that they're working to. And I think Andrea in her slides mentioned a lot of quality that we're looking at where we look at games and so-called the magic circle as a way uh, to be a safe space for the audience to create theories, to, to test their theories, uh, to come up with an iterative process by try and error to find out what actually work and what doesn't work in a specific situated situations. Um, so um, we did a lot of things. I have worked there. I worked there for about six years, and over the six years, I designed over thirty games or play experience uh, for different kind of subjects in school. And um, you know, I'm not going to go into details in terms of how those uh, games were produced, but at school we don't call game game we call them a scenario because from the learning point of view and this also goes back to the pyramids that andrea was showing uh first of all we know that 60 percent of the knowledge that we learn over our lifetime it came from embodiment it came from moving our body or remember things by body we all have air golf swings in our life we always do air baseball we all do air guitar we have all these little things that we do with our gestures or our body to kind of associate that with a piece of information to remember it longer. Um, so, so we understand that theories. And, and so when we're designing a game, it's not just about what you do in the game. It is also about what you do before the games and after the games. And I think we pushed that theory even further in 2012 when we work with uh, uh, Samsung on this idea of connected learning. So we kind of connecting all this different learning scenario and learning modules together and to identify different learning space in our audience day-to-day -day life. So for middle school students, uh, there's three major space where learning happens. One is classrooms, the other one is um, after school uh, space and the, other, and the, next, uh, the last one is their home. Right. So how do we create a learning experience that can go from one space to another and then connect that to another place? Um, so uh, this theory goes on and on and on. But most important things I think the takeaway here is I don't think the learning happens only in the games. Um, it happens when how the teacher set it up for the kids and how teacher asks a critical questions in a, a pivot moment in the gameplay or how teacher or uh, the learning moderator 
uh, talk about the game experience with people who have played the games, right? I think that moment where you connect real life events to the game experience that they have, either in the virtual reality or immersive learning space, that moment will form active knowledge for the audience and something that they can use on their day-to-day -day life is something that will remember for a long time. So um, it is very important to see a learning experience as a dynamic systems and, and understanding that not just the, in the game itself, but before and after and all around uh, could be a part for a holistic learning experience. So um, I think my, my, um, my, one of my most uh, uh, achieved moment was I have my boss on the New York Times magazine, on the cover of New York Times magazine, and, and the, the system that we're designing, learning for, uh, game and learning for, was selected and um, was was put as one of the four technologies that would change the future of digital learning. Um, so for all that fun things, we also learned in the process that you know technology can attract uh, our audience attention. So we're constantly bringing in new things in our installation uh, complex, complex. And we look at many, many other technologies. So uh, tablets, and I think, you know, if you still remember Google Tango, uh, we later on try, you know, HoloLens and all that stuff. But in 2010, we were looking for VR goggle and there's none available in the market. Um, it's either that we cannot afford it, like the left one, which is the industrial one that costs $32,000 to buy. And even though it looked lightweight and can produce HD graphic, it come with a giant computer on wheels. Um, and then you have the cheap uh, video game version that came out in 2007, but the resolution was only, I think, uh, was was 320 by 160. So everything was so pixelated. But, you know, I think if you have a few shots, you might have a good time with this. Um, on the right one uh, is the, the cinema glass that we all use to watch movie. And none of them were, were was ideal. But then, you know, the magic happens. Um, the DK1 came out on Kickstarters, and we were really excited. So uh, not only thinking about trying that in the middle school, uh, environments, I, I brought this idea to Parsons that I think, you know, Parsons students are very good at creating digital content. So like, doesn't matter if they're a web designer or a graphic designer, uh, if the, uh, uh, they're a photographer, digital, they're illustrator, we're very, we already having a school that's teaching students how to create digital contents. Um, and why don't we channel some of those contents into VR? And there's a very important thing here is I think if you look at the history of hardware, um, VR kind of plays a different role. Um, they, they're not here to replace how we view media, but they provide an alternative way to look at media in a very immersive way. So, so uh, we're not worried about uh, VR goggle will replace TV for us or replace the IMAX cinema for us, but if you want to see something in 360, if you don't want to follow a director's cue on looking at things, VR is the way to go. So um, since 2013, I have been pushing uh, classes to open and things to be done at Parsons to sort of helping students get it into this VR environment. Um, um, so I have done a lot of things about games at Parsons. I taught uh, one of the first few classes that taught is to teach kids how to uh, kind of build uh, uh, Nintendo NES cartridges by themselves. So we use this because, you know, we have a really registry, really weird registry programs at Parsons. So uh, try to teach game production in a semester, a bit as actually a pretty good platform. So um, so once when I finish my work at Quest to Learn, I came back to Parsons and I take over the BFA design technology program. And um, I started pushing for game design. So I, I designed the design, the, I designed the indie game design um, pathway for the undergrads. And I also started a minor on immersive storytelling. I helped the school uh, put together a motion capture studio for students who want to do motion capture for their games. Or um, my dream at the time is I want to have people 
able to wear the uh, you know to have a sort of a, a, com a community experience of uh, VR. Um, and that was one of the sole pur purpose for the mocap studio. And, you know, so my job at Parson is really, I look at new technology and thinking about what does that apply to our designer and artist kits. And one of the very important thing is to help them form pipelines. So when they have an idea, other than the roots of what, how they practice or how they make things, we can add elements into it and help them build something that can channel or turn their work into uh, on, onto a different platform. So this is one, actually, we just taught a workshop at Parsons using this web, uh, VR web editor called Stelly. And, um, and we kind of miss and match a bunch of different things together. And, um, and kids from all over the school, we have 32 different design programs from, you know, hands-on to research-based to very analog programs. And, it's, and we have students from every program sort of enjoy this process of a little bit of embodied uh, interactions and um, using online services to change the format of their creations and port it into things that doesn't require any programming languages. And they will be able to see their works in person uh, in the art uh, in a matter of 30 minutes. So we're pushing for this kind of things because not all of our students want to learn coding. Not all of our students want to learn um, uh, Unity or Unreal Engines, uh, but a lot of them want to see their work in VR. So this is one of our approach uh, to help them bring their work um, from anywhere uh, into a VR space. And uh, in terms of cross-school collaborations, we now at Parson has a center called X Reality Center is uh, spearheaded by our uh, uh, um, faculty uh, Maya. And uh, so on the right, on the right is Maya. On the left is Thomas. Thomas is the guru of uh, XR Center. He is a student, but he has been working in the XR Center to help students pick up techniques and tools uh, to produce contents for VR. So this is a collaboration that we did with the fashion uh, school of fashions. Um, I don't know if you, you're probably familiar with fashion school more than anything else at Parsons. So fashion has a collection of about 9,800 garments and uh, a design clothes from the early 1900s. And you know we usually roll it up and store it in a, in a Vendelade uh, uh, classrooms. But you know there's so many good and really well done design in there that we want students to be able to see. So we took, um, so the fashion took out a garment that was from 1920s. And this is a garment you will wear after dinner. If you go to a concert after dinner or a social scene, this is where you'll be wearing outside. So we had gone through this whole process of 3D scanning it um, in great details. Uh, when you look close, you can actually see the cross sections of the, the fabric and everything. And um, and so this is so the the animated GIF you can see sort of a 360 rotation of the final skin that we have. Then we pour this into Oculus, and have uh, and then we bring like sort of giving it a historical touch. And so you when you walk into this garment, it will interact with you a little bit and tell you the history of the garments. And so like this is kind of like the pilot experiments that we did. Like this could be a way for how we archive historical garments and uh, collections that we have at school. I don't know if I'm, and you know, the other way is sort of the push, the, the, the teaching and what's going on in the university sort of around the world. And I mean, if you're familiar with the work from Parsons, you know that we have gone through a serious sort of curriculum re, re, redo in the in 2012 to think about how do we move around move away from this idea of master apprentice relationship to a more sort of a collaborative and agile environment so you know i feel like i always feel like it's my mission to talk about this more um to open up a new sort of a territory for people to learn based on their own uh interests you know not just following or, or try to copy whatever the teacher is doing so I do a lot of international workshops uh, all over the world, and and 
we talk about VR, AR, we talk about uh, character design, we cover anything that's related to uh, interactive design or um, um, immersive uh, media, but not necessarily try to turn the participants or students, and this is also true at Parsons, into uh, immersion or immersive experience developers, right? We want them to learn about why this media is so popular and how this media can do things for them. And it's up to them how, to, how they're gonna take advantage of this um, um, powers. Uh, the last thing I wanna answer um, based on our discussions is the trend in New York. We're very fortunate there's a lot of people in New York trying to push this and a lot of people wanna establish New York as sort of a counterpart of the Silicon Valley uh, while we value design and human centered de human centered design in general and related research more than technology itself. So um, we have an entity in New York called R Lab. Uh, they sort of kind of standing in between the industry and the school and faculty and all the research institutions in New York, and they create projects and collaboration to bring the two together. And right now, um, there's so this is all the areas that we're looking at right now. Um, I'm gonna start in the middle. Um, so media, entertainments, and game is one of the most popular topic, of course. And you can, I wanna point out that you can actually see, uh, so the company in New York, or in general, people are pushing for to separate entertainment from games, right? Because um, um, there's a lot of sort of a sort of potential audience there are, walking away from VR because they think it's a game. Um, so you see a lot of effort of differentiate them or separate them in the business, in the VR business. Um, so other stuff like smart cities, how do we access information quicker? Um, um, and there's other things like ethical considerations, you know, for example, all the stuff that Parson is doing is a lot of time about social justice and um, uh, create awareness of what's going on in the society and stuff like that. And um, I think the most popular topic right now uh, is the uh, healthcare, medicine, and wellness. Um, I don't know if, if all of you are familiar with how um, sort of uh, a healthcare works in America. For the longest time, the healthcare is decided by your hospital, um, your pharmacy, and your insurance company. The, the patient actually didn't get a say in that process. Uh, so this is why I think following this year, there's a lot of company sort of kind of uh, indie companies especially are looking into how can we design a better healthcare, a better process, a better experience from the point of view of our patient, which is something that we will do in New York because you know all the design companies in New York are um, um, user centered. So this is pretty much it. There's a lot, I was trying to cover it, but then <laughs> I hope you understand <laughs> what's going yeah. on. Great. Thank Thanks, thanks Kyle. Thanks for um, giving us um, you know, some kind of info, um, kind of probably industry insider info about uh, higher education and what, what you guys are doing. Uh, and the trends and, uh, and, and maybe a glimpse of what's, what's gonna happen to the next generation. And uh, it's interesting that both like from the business side and the education side kind of both touch upon uh, the idea of gamification. I think we can um, get into that a little bit deeper later, but um, I actually wanna ask uh, Andrea from, from, the, from, from the business side, like, so, when when um, when client asks you to develop uh, VR training tools, are they expecting to um, like replicate the, the real world scenarios? And uh, what are the, the rooms for for design and and creativity? So and also like where does your you know architecture design uh, skill set comes into play? Um. There's no short answer to that. So typically the client comes and we go through a series of workshops because we need to make sure that they're using VR to solve 
certain kind of issues that they could not solve using cheaper methods. Uh, because the, the last thing we would want is to have a client that invests a lot of money into a VR application that they end up not using or just not getting the return um, on that money that they would like to see because uh, this is not just going to harm us and our relationship with that client, but really the whole kind of industry going forward. So we are, in, in terms of kind of like the overall business point of view, we are still a very new industry. So we are seeing a lot of things going on, but there are still a lot of risks. And all of us VR developers are very aware that we need to push right now and for the next couple of years to get as many success stories out there as possible. Um, because there have been cases in the past where the big companies invested in a lot of expensive technology and development and they ended up not getting the results that they wanted. So it's good to also kind of have that side of things in mind when you look at the business thing. So stories like Magic Leap, which was a mixed reality headset still is, but you know, they run into, they got, I think around $3 billion in investments a few years ago, and then they run into a lot of issues with producing and marketing that. Um, so it's good to kind of keep as many perspective in mind as possible when you when you think of this technology um, and uh, the more commercial side of things. So I thought it was great that I I had I showed all of these uh, very very kind of business oriented study cases and then Kyle showed these amazing applications with playing with kids and experimenting and introducing them to all these things. Um, but yeah, they're 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 very different sides of of this new technology story that saga that we're in do, do you have to work with like game game designers because you mentioned like it's a uh, it's more engaging if uh, if the simulation if the, if the virtual reality of the, so uh, of the software it's more like a game you have to kind of work with them to come up with like the the play you know like uh, how do how do you uh, how do you win the game or, or you know how to get more points so we um, most developers in VR right now do come from the gaming industry. I would say 90%, the vast majority of them. Um, so they have a very particular approach to how they design everything and how they think of this gamification aspect and how you win things. Um, and we come from an architecture background. So all of us in my studio, we are architects who are also programmers. So we have a slightly different take on things, um, but we have started to play a lot of games. So we buy, <laughs> we buy a lot of computer games as, uh, as many as we can. And we actually have certain hours, uh, times in the office when uh, we just play games. <laughs> so, um, so we try to, we try to, to learn a little bit of what of that component that we might be missing a bit because you know we're architects, we were not trained to, to think of those of how you make people want to collect more points. Um, but the the parts that we are very good at are things like what's behind me. So you ask about where my architectural education comes into play. So um, what you see behind me is a structure that we generated in Grasshopper. And we sold this to the client as an entire level in their training application because we said it's the it's it's supposed to represent the bone tissue so we actually had um like this medical instruments and screws and things like this kind of go and screw themselves into parts of these uh of these kind of cellular structure um and because it is so amazingly fun and spatial in the way we designed it um this actually became everyone's favorite thing to do in this VR application. Um, so we do our, our knowledge of, of, of spatial design and tools that we know how to use from architecture um, did in many cases end up bringing a lot to the table when it comes to enjoyment and your desire to keep doing more things in there. And 
it's because we took this alternative approach, I think, that our studio has been so successful so far. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm curious, like, so um, what do you think, like, which, which type of companies are, are more likely to uh, adopt um, VR technology in, in, in learning? Um, is it industry specific? Is it more, um, I mean, with the tech companies are more likely to, to, you know, to use VR? I think maybe Kyle can, can also um, share if, like your experience. Um, both of you, yeah. What well, type of companies are, yeah. So um, uh, most of the, I want to, I actually want to speak to uh, projects that we did um, that Spy Cafe is involved in, in as the middleman. Um, so I remember having a phone call with Tim, which is the founder of Spy Cafe in Taipei. And he mentioned to me that Panasonic is visiting MIT a uh, couple years ago. So I kind of intercept that visit. I was like, why don't you stop by Parsons for a visit, right? Because um, I think MIT has famous for you know their their excellent research in technology, um, but now we're in a market where uh, a lot of companies is looking for the user research and what user thinking, <clears throat> and and you know that's sort of just what the trend is at the moment. Um, so I I successfully convinced them that design matters, user-centered design research matters. So they stop by and, and work with us. And I think in, in many part of that process, you know, the idea of game design, idea of interactions, uh, idea of emotion design becomes a very big part of it. And um, one of the very interesting uh, conversation that we had with Panasonic is they, they told us that, you know, they are the national appliances in Japan, and they have the best uh, product designer in the world working for them. But those uh, product designers are in their 50s. And when you ask them to design something that's fun and interactive for younger people, they draw a blank. All they think about is complain, <laughs> you know, like the Asian style. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so <clears throat> I think uh, I think a lot of companies are, are looking for changes. and. I was told the uh, Panasonic collaboration with Parsons on this product design uh, project is the first in a hundred years in their history to work with the external design agency. And, but this is changing, the, the industry is changing. Uh, you see, if you see Sony and other Japanese electronic giant, now they have their separate uh, design lab that's supporting innovation and stuff. And a lot of them are trying to looking for way of, do, way of doing things um, that can bypass the traditional bureaucratic systems uh, that that you know a big company has established over the years. Um, so that is a very broad answer to to okay. what people are looking for. Um, most of the cases I've seen is they they're not particularly open a VR departments in their company to look at VR. A lot of them are done through collaborations. Uh, be, I mean, mm. in, in New York, the, the, the case is more so like that because um, the city is, is pushing and for uh, startups and, uh, com you know, and the entity like our lab and uh, all the school actually in New York are hoping their students are thinking about, you know, new technology, immersive technology startups. So every year you'll have incubator programs like we have we have at least five different uh, uh, incubator program in New York City that's focusing on different aspects of a business model. Some of them more technical, some of them more user friendly, some of them more customer experience driven and, and stuff like that. So um, you see a lot of these options every year. So it's it's easier to just collaborate with those new startups, even at, at the end, buying them, buying the company, then starting a new department in your company. Hmm. I see. Yeah. I see. Cool. Um, speaking of collaboration, um, do you think um, VR is a good medium for, you know, social or collaborative learning? Uh, there's, a, there's, there's many. I mean, Andrea, please speak up. If you, 
<laughs> if you have any insight yeah. to this. Uh, but from a learning point of view, there's definitely a lot of effort put into that. I think one of the biggest problems uh, or challenges for people thinking about VR as sort of a item that we can add into our living room experience or to our day-to-day -day experience is the lack of social experience, right? So, uh, and that's sort of kind of the personality or the characteristic of a VR experience where when you put on a goggle, you're by yourself, right? Um, so there's a lot of effort right now, actually, try to bring collaborations or the social experience into um, VR experiences. And uh, one of the recent one that I feel like it's interesting was actually by the Magic Leap. Um, um, it's their, it's the avatar app, right? So they are able to put the avatar of the person that you're chatting sort of into your physical space. So when you talk, you actually have someone to look at. <clears throat> so, mm. and you can do some basic sort of a gesture in actions and uh, through the controllers and stuff. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting approach, right? And then also the stuff that the Netflix is doing where you can watch um, a movie with your friends in this fake 3D living room, right? So um, there's, a, I mean, also, you know, the quest to learn default space. There's a lot of mm. effort into pushing it forward. But, it, you know, because I, I, a lot of time I feel like the technology is the same. It really depends on how you tell the stories, right? So I think most of the companies and uh, business that I have been seeing in, at least in America, are more about business. How do we, how do we create a conference room for people to have business? Uh, and like if you, I mean, if, I mean, Zoom is not VR, but there's many other apps that's similar to VR that's focused on business environments, right? And we have a few projects at Parson actually is looking at a, a virtual classroom experience uh, to bring kids from different places into one classroom and talking about uh, the subjects. <clears throat> and I want I just want to point out that the reason that, that the game and learning and game VR didn't really went into full blast in the beginning was because there was a health concern for younger kids, like kids below 13 years old. Uh, because, you know, all the muscles around our eyes are still developing. And with, mm. uh, with the current VR goggle design, we're, we're actually unconsciously pushing our eyes to look at a specific focal point. And that for kids who are developing their muscles uh, on operating their eyes to focus is actually not good. Um, if you use it for too long, it might, it might have permanent damages. So if you look at all the mm. health health warning on the, all the VR goggles, like 13 and younger do not use VR for too long. And, um, you know, but, but 13 and under is the biggest market <laughs> for, for game and learning, you know? And, and that, is, that is one of the biggest challenge. challenge. Actually, one some inspired me to bring this back to university and see how it works in university instead of staying in the, the middle school range and to see uh, the possibility of VR. This is still a problem, um, but but you know I think by design you probably be able to ha come up with a healthier experience uh, for younger children, but it's not recommended. I see. So I want to add something quickly to that. Um, to answer your question, Harvia, I think there's huge potential in this learning and collaboration, even if we exclude children under 13. Even if you just, for example, deal with training for grown-ups or college-level kids. Um, however, I I do think that in order for this industry to mature and leave behind these kind of early stages growing pains, we need to move from a very generalized approach and discussion to more kind of realistic and detailed, nuanced conversations. I hear too much generalization going on. For example, um, people talking about, oh, let's just move the entire classrooms in VR and do everything in VR. And I think that's just the wrong approach. And if you start like that, you're gonna be setting yourself up for disappointment. So there are basic things like in VR, we still do not have an efficient way to read and write. So if whatever activity is going on with your students, 
um, requires that you reference a lot of written text. So you have to call up emails or PDFs or books or whatever. It's very hard to read that in VR. There's just no good way to do it. If you have to type or take notes, again, people are experimenting right now with like amazingly creative um, ways to, to type. Um, there is um, hand tracking that's starting to be used right now in certain headsets, but it is still cumbersome as hell. Like you just do not want to do more than write a few words. So, um, so this already is a basis for forcing you to discriminate against what makes sense in VR and what doesn't. Um, the, another big thing that's missing in VR, um, for me personally, is the lack of being able to see humans' facial expression. So you have an avatar that might signal to you, for example, when someone is moving their mouth or saying something or is blinking a little bit, but you can't see facial expressions. And that is a huge thing to take out of any kind of interaction. So if I was the teacher and I had a group of kids, um, you know, some of them are a little bit more quiet, like you need to be able to read their face to see how they respond to things and you can't do that in VR. Um, but not all is negative. There are also amazing things. So I can also give you an example of things that, um, that I personally love to do in, in social VR. So uh, whenever I give um, talks like this or I'm part of VR lectures, after the lecture ends, there is always a little bit of a chit chat. That's exactly what would happen in, in the real world, right? So um, people come towards you or come towards the speakers from the stage and um, they kind of start to be like, oh, hey, Andrea, so nice to meet you. I mean, like, you know, seeing your tweets or whatever, so nice to kind of like meet you in person. How's it going? So they, they, they kind of introduce themselves and they ask the kind of more casual questions that they wouldn't ask, you know, during the formal recording. And then other people come and they kind of sit around you and they listen. And if they're interested, they'll, they'll stay. If not, they'll move on and go to another group. And I've kind of met people and made friends and just feel like I've actually met them in person. Um, so there was this spatial dynamic and social interaction component that I never had happened with this kind of events, right? So if someone from an audience would want to just hang out with me after this, we don't really have a possibility to do that spontaneously. So that kind of like hanging out chit chat that has its own content and its own value um, works amazingly well in VR. So I would completely introduce VR as part of a teaching experience or even like business meetings, but strategically. So let's say, we, I would say, we ha let's have a Zoom talk to talk business and have, have the ability to pull my emails. And then let's have happy hour in VR, you know, and have a, a more relaxed uh, or let's do brainstorming in VR where we can prototype and draw in three dimensions together um, for one hour. And then let's move back to like a more video type thing. So um, I think a combination approach is the right way forward. But for that, people need to be knowledgeable and informed about when and how to do it and what are the particular affordances of each medium and each type of interaction. That's interesting. So you actually socialize in an avatar, like you're like an avatar and you talk to other people, like they talk to other avatars. Yes, isn't, isn't, this, isn't this amazing? So let's say I, I'm, I meet a person on LinkedIn, right? So someone sends me an invite and then we start to chat a little bit on LinkedIn, right? So technically I feel a little bit like, okay, I kind of met them, right? But I wouldn't, mm. I wouldn't use that word the way I would use the word if I actually was to have a coffee with them at some kind of event, right? Like physically meet them. But then if I meet them in my avatar, in the space, if we share the three-dimensional space on, of VR, I absolutely 100% have the feeling that I actually met them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. it's and actually maybe I, you're an avatar you might be more open up sometimes you kind of like well, more willing to share ideas i think it's the space i feel like it's, it feel like it feels the fact that 
I was there with that person in the same space in my brain. It clicks the, okay, I met them box. Um, and doing the same interaction over like LinkedIn chat or whatever, um, somehow doesn't tick that box. So it's that feeling that you are in one space with someone. Um, mm. I see. So, you know what? Uh, actually, I was I was uh, hoping that I can uh, buy um, uh, Oculus Quest, but I realized now in this pandemic they're all sold out. So you can't get any, um, you know, Oculus goggles anymore. So it seems like um, there's um, it's growing, right? So how do you think this, like for both of you, how do you think this 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 pandemic will will, will change? the VR industry? Is it going to be like, oh, it's, it's, it's going to be like a Nintendo Switch. So everyone is going to be like more comfortable using VR and like kind of more um, receptive um, of the VR content environments? I can go. <laughs> I, I think again that it cuts both ways. This, <laughs> this is my theme for tonight. Um, and by that, I mean, I think there are, it's gonna popularize the industry. A lot of people are already, you know, having VR on, the, on their radar because of, of, of this current crisis. Um, I also think just the way Zoom is making a lot more people aware of the limitations of this type of technology. It's also gonna make people be more critical of this type of digital interactions. So I think we saw a wave of enthusiasm. Oh my God, we actually have these tools. Let's just now do everything over, over these uh, digital media. Um, and now we are slowly starting to see a more sophisticated kind of discourse coming out um, in that people are like, okay, but this is also, these are some pieces of criticism. So we have to be a little bit more, more caref careful in how, how we, we are doing things. So what's happening with VR right now, um, there are things like people who spend many hours in VR for the first time and then they come out of VR. They kind of are starting to have little revelations about how important physical bodies actually are. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like they, they spend a lot of time in VR trying to, to do certain things that you know they cannot because of, you don't have sensors on your legs or you can't really feel your body moving the way you would. And, um, and then they get out and they're like, oh my God, I have a body and it works amazingly well. Look at all these muscles and all these movements I can do. Um, so I think we're gonna settle at some point um, in like a sweet spot where, you know, we, we go into VR to gain certain kind of superpowers that we would absolutely not have in the real world. And then we come back to the real world and we actually, and the VR experience is actually helping us appreciate and enjoy our physical bodies and physical reality more and i think that's kind of a game game win-win situation Kaya, anything you want to add well i I, th I think we have been talking about this concept of presence right and and um you know harvey we're friends and when we talk on facebook all the time i don't feel like you're too far away from me you know even though you're in hong kong i'm in new york and this is, happens to a lot of, you know, modern relationship where you have a friend goes far away to work. You don't really feel like they're gone because you still keep your chat online constantly. And I think for the newer generations <clears throat> and uh, uh, for the newer generation, this is going to become a norm in their day-to-day -day life in terms of presence. Is person to person or, or in person is no longer an option anymore. I think this quarantine really sort of pushed that to a extreme level, right? Um, you know, mm -hmm. we have, I, for example, I have friends, <clears throat> I have students who set up Zoom meeting to eat together, mm -hmm. right? And, but, you know, they're not having, they're not have like, they're not having a Chinese style where we have like, you know, lazy Susan in the middle and we turn the table, everyone is sharing the same dishes. They don't, they cook themselves. 
and then they <laughs> they laid it out on their table, and then they have a Zoom meeting with other people so they can eat together, right? And this is actually last year we have a student did a thesis on this. We think she's crazy, but with the pandemic, <laughs> with the pandemic that's happening, a lot of this start people start to consider all these options, and I always I always push that is like we sometimes think this type of situation. Or the the idea of being alone or entertaining yourself alone is pathetic. We we can say that because we get to compare. But if if you know if situation like this、uh, doesn't get lifted, or、um, or you know I don't know, people are saying pandemic can might come back in fall and stuff like that. This could be part of the future that we're saying, right? So so I think I think. I think right now the only complaint I do have a lot of more time to play VR games, but you know the during the pandemic time. But I want to say that I feel like this pandemic VR was I think VR industry was also not prepared, which means that besides game, there's very little other things you can do with VR as an AR.、Um, mm. So so you know I I would I I always I have been telling my students and myself that looking at this as a creative. As a moment for more creative, to be more creative, you know, looking at staying at home、um, as opportunity to design or make more things.、Um, so, I just I want to I want to talk a little bit about my background as well. So,、um, uh, I made this background for、uh, our final review is coming up, and I made this background for the final review, and、um, nice. you know. And 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 Harvey, you know that you know you talk about design technology, and at DT, what we do is you know we think about all the possibility that we can play with things, and we try to bring bring down all the walls、uh, between areas of study. So、um, Andrea was talking about the background that she has because her architecture background. I, I then I was like, oh, this is a perfect segue for me because I I you know I have game design background, and at Parson we also does a lot of electronics, so I hack. A video game console. I don't know if you can see this.、Uh, this is yeah, a game、yeah. controller for Sega Saturn. And now I can fly.、Oh, wow. I can I can fly in my own space. <laughs> wow, nice. And I can destroy <laughs> can spa spaceship from ITP and Pratt and other design school in New York. <laughs> so you know, while I'm in the meeting, you know, I can indulge in myself a little bit. I have this, I made this little cockpit for myself to give me. My necessary uh, uh, information. We talked about in the in the beginning. So this is now the day fifty one for me to stay at home. I have never stepped out out of my apartment、wow. since March fifteen,、mm -hmm. right? So so I have a time counter to tell me every day when I log into my Zoom, I know that I'm how many day away from the reality. <laughs> so. You know, I think everyone is looking for ways to be creative in this moment, and 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 I,、um, and you know, I think we should keep doing it.、Um, but I don't think,、uh, to your question, I think VR and AR definitely people have more opportunity to use those tools. But I don't feel like the software、mm. part, the content part, is is ready to go yet.、Mm. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks. I think we can like this topic is really interesting. I think we can go on and on, but I think we should take. Some questions from our online audience. So one question: um, we, um, so VR can create an immersive and engaging learning environment that might not be possible to provide outside of VR, such as emergency rooms and an airplane engine. But if the same environment can be provided without VR. Recreating is there still a reason for using VR? Okay. No. If if you if I、There's、mean、no、if、reason. you have if you if VR doesn't offer any extra value, like if you have access to the real thing, if everyone has equal access to the real thing and you can do all the interactions, then no. But Even if you take the example of an airplane engine, I mean, you can't. Let's say for some reason, Boeing does have like 200 engines lying around for all its engineers. Let's just assume that and the space for it.、Um, you still can't have people 
practice or look at certain things while the engine is running, for example. So hmm. that keeps even that the VR. traveling time is does not does not count to like the traveling time and stuff, right? What do you mean by that? Like access access the, the the engine. Like say the engine is available, but then you know you don't. Um, you, you, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what right. I mean? Like, so, like it, it's the, uh, the um, you know, given the context is the same, I guess. And you say, you think there's no value. Right. But I, I would argue in, in all, in all of those cases, I would still find some value in VR. Like you have the engine lying around, you can give it to a student to practice on. Let's say they learn how to change a certain piece, but they wouldn't be able to see the engine running, you know, unless and the engine was in an actual airplane and flying. But in VR, you can kind of, I mean, it's, this is what we're doing with our training apps. We also program animations. So if you, you can also notice how the moving parts are actually supposed to be moving and, and there are certain dimensions that um, you can almost always find that could benefit from VR. Right, right. Okay, uh, thanks. And I, yeah, you want to add? I, yeah. I just want to add one point to it. I think, uh, well, maybe two. I'll do a half and half. Um, so when we come to game and learning, I think one of the most feature for game and learning is we are able to create a safe environment for the audience to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, you know, if we can get audience attention, we have an opportunity to teach them and VR does this better than anything else because when you put on a goggle, it takes over your entire vision, right? So you're forced to focus on this environment and the idea of having it to be a safe place because, for example, borrow Andrea's idea of engine. Um, you can't blow an engine up in front of you. You cannot make a mistake if you're dealing with a real engine, but in a virtual space, you could do that. You can, you can try to toss things around and see what happens or... Uh, you can set on fire and walk away or something like that. You can, you can actually build theories and test it with this model and see if your theory works, right? So, and I think those are really, really good, good value for any type of sort of, sort of a play experience that had an opportunity to teach or allow you to learn. That's very important. And, and I think the downside for VR is really sort of, you can't really represent Right now, we're not there yet. Like to make it hundred percent real. Um, same thing with the engine is I don't get to touch, I don't get to feel the steel, I don't get to feel the temperature of it, and when it's on, I cannot feel the vibration of it. Even though there's a lot of effort into redesign the tactile or force feedback or haptic feedback uh, device that people can hold, put their hands on. But based on what I have tested, um, we are not there yet. So, so there are pros and cons. In that, in that, but I think uh, be able to create a safe space to make mistake is really sort of a, a very, very crucial um, uh, element for building a learning experience in VR. Right. Cool. That's um, there is uh, another question from the audience for actually for for Kyle. So um, he's asking. Um, He's specifically thinking about the projection of a uh, angle ruler that Kyle showed on one picture, and why not use a regular angle ruler? That's a very good question. Um, so, <laughs> the the experience that we make in in uh, in school usually has two purposes. Um, one purpose is introduce a new idea. And the other is to reinforce something that I have learned in the classrooms, right? So like I said in the presentation, none of our games are, are working alone. They're usually accompanying with a lesson plan or something that they learn in school. And, you know, if you we go back to the triangle, the, the pyramid, the learning pyramids that Andrea showed, um, and I will, I will argue that, you know, a good learning is actually combining all of them together in a series. So the same knowledge you being you being learned through writing, you being learned through reading, you being learned through embodiment, you being learned through play, that just reinforces the connection and association in your head to that piece of knowledge, and then the possibility for that knowledge to become an active one is severely higher than just doing either ways, right? So, 
the the protractor one that you guys saw was actually part of the final uh, experience that we have at Quest to Learn. In Quest to Learn, we don't have final final exam as a middle school. We call it the boss level. So hmm. you have to go through a series of tests uh, that usually uh, accompanying with the narrative. Uh, for that particular one is sort of a kind of a carnival with a mystery happen. So we have this character that we designed at school called Professor Pai, and he was he has been kidnapped. So the entire school is looking for where professor is. And we mm. have many booths set up in different rooms that plays different games about a math theorem or a math concept. So the project, the one is the one we set up in uh, the small lab, the installation that we have. It's for kids to you know, try to, try to calculate the supplemental uh, angle of uh, in math, right? So, they have to work together to move this giant protractor to fit the, the questions and find out what the supplemental angle is. So there is the collaborations, there is the, the size um, experience, there's the safe environments for theory building. So I think a lot of time for something that I already know, been doing in the classroom, this is actually a very, very good in, environment to review what they have learned and put them in actions. I hope that long answer uh, answers the <laughs> questions because I ask myself all the time too. <laughs> okay, well, we have quite a lot of questions. Uh, let's take two more questions. Um, so another question. So um, I read Magic Leap is struggling to enter the market. Is AR still too young to be a real tool for regular companies? So yeah, uh, Magic Leap is the company that I mentioned earlier that got like billions in investment about four years ago, three, four years ago. Um, and they are a mixed reality company. So they're something like the HoloLens from Microsoft. So they're glasses you put on and you kind of see these like hologram kind of things overlapping um, the physical reality in front of you. Um, and Two weeks ago, they laid off half of their workforce, like several hundred developers. A lot of my friends got laid off um, because they are shutting down their entire consumer department. So they got those billions in investment based on the premise that they were going to sell a few hundred thousand headsets um, in two or three years they only end up selling a few thousand. Um, and there were just many, many things that went wrong, both in terms of their strategy, the content they put out there, their price points, um, what the hardware could and could not do. So um, yeah, that's basically the story with Magic Leap. So, so right so, now, yeah. yeah. The, the part that I also asks is about is uh, is AR. I think is more specifically AR is still still too young to be a real tool for for, uh, for so, companies. AR, yeah. So technically, we we still argue about all of these definitions and terminology. So I understand why people are confused. Sometimes I'm confused as well. But the the wider accepted definition of AR is basically the stuff that you can do with your phone or your tablet. So things like Ikea AR is where you can place an Ikea chair in your living room or a couch and see what it would look like in your living room. So the app opens the camera of the device that you're holding and overlaps this um, on top of the real world. And that's doing great actually. There's, we are seeing more and more uses for it. Um, these uses are still mostly for marketing purposes. Um, many of us are still waiting for what we call the killer AR app. Um, so something that could be actually used in production halls and industrially and you know something that would kind of have a business model and a use case behind it beyond marketing. Um, but I think that's definitely coming. So the, the AR market is doing quite well. I see. Definitely, definitely, I mean, in other territory, definitely better than VR 
um, you know, people think it's, it's a more practical approach because you don't have to isolate yourself from the real world. You can kind of see through uh, or even with phone app, you can kind of use it while you're in the real world. You don't, you're not isolated into another space. But I think, you know, if we step out and looking at the business as general, and I want to point you to, you know, I recently I start to feel like, oh, this is why Steve Jobs once said that he wanted to reinvent all the technology living room, right? Because everyone has a living room. Everyone need their appliances in the living room. We can't live without TV. We can't live without, I don't know. I, I shouldn't mention radio, but I just feel like, Maybe radio. you know, some, yeah, we need, we still need radio, and uh, you know, we can, we have, you know, we listen to music in our living room. So, all the things that Apple has been doing is reinvent the appliances inside of living room and think about ways to connect to them, connect them together and share data, whatever. Because everyone has a living room, we all need to buy appliances for our living room. So that is a big business, and for for being in a design school looking at technology for. You know, for for that many years, you you see like multi-touch tables. Still, people still remember multi-touch tables. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, the three D printer, right? We all have this mm. technology hype in our history, and the, you know, VR and AR is the latest one. And you know, the reason that they are sticking around for a few years and they go away because they couldn't find a place in our day to day life. We don't need them all the time, right? And I think this goes back to what Andrea was talking about. What is the killer app for VR? What is the killer app for AR? You know, and we have, you know, uh, we have to, we actually have been being optimistic in the past couple of years. We're hoping that when 5G open up, you know, when, when voice assistant become fully accessible and can have real authentic conversation with us, this might be able to help VR and AI find their purpose in our day-to-day -day life, you know, in terms of, streaming in, in terms of communications, in terms of uh, telepresence, uh, but we still not see that happening yet. You know, this is why earlier I said in during the quarantine, we still, we don't have enough good software to help us go through our day-to-day -day tasks uh, in VRs and AR. You know, it's a good escape for me, but I, wa I, wa I wasn't able to be productive uh, with those tools, which is a problem. Um, so, um, we, the, the killer app is still missing. And, um, but I think VR and AR compared to other technology actually has stick around for a longer time because they're interesting. And I think they successfully become an alternative media viewing platform compared to what we talk about, you know, IMAX and TV, you know, and, and I think for that, they kind of have that ability to kind of stick around. And, and when there's newer technology coming out, it sounds always more interesting if you combine it with VRs and AR than saying, oh, I'm doing a, a AI machine on my computer screen. That does not sound interesting. But if you say, I build a cyborg in VR, they're like, let me try it. So, so I think the ARs <laughs> and VR still have that charm there. But it's just we don't know what their role is um, in our day-to-day -day life yet. OK, cool. Um, great. Um, I think, um, we are almost at the end. I would like to ask, uh, you know, kind of this open-ended final question to wrap up. Um, so, so basically, um, during this uh, pandemic, um, many people started to realize our, our education system didn't teach us to prepare for the unpredictable future. And, uh, how, how to like, uh, foster a more resilient generation is becoming more and more important. And could could we do something with, with VR or or like or the VR companies or or is this the, the direction to go? Could this um, kind of help um, the situation in, in, in building a resiliency or even like a game gamification? Any any thoughts on that? That just like really broad I you know um, but just really, really want to hear um, your thoughts on this. Well, <laughs> uh, so as a, as a teacher, I actually don't have an answer to that because I'm disappointed on the education system as well. <laughs> um, and also to your point, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of 
a learning institution has become too big, they're kind of operating like a corporation, and and in return, there's there's a lot of bureaucracy going on. So a lot of situations, it's not about learning anymore. It's it's all about how to survive, how to get more emissions, and all that kind of stuff. So so, but I want to encourage everyone that that you shouldn't expect learning from other people or other medium. You should start to create a motivation for yourself that you want to learn. I think once you have that motivation, um, it will change the world for you. And there's so many knowledge out there in different format, uh, in different places that you can go and find it for yourself. And um, when it comes to VRs and AR, you know, where I mean, we're definitely not there yet. Right. But there's a lot of effort, like what Andrea mentioned earlier, in how do we read better? How do we how do we read better in VR? How do how do we display text in a comfortable way where we can read for three hours in the VR experiences? How can we write? How do we do inputs in VR? And I think a lot once we have those technology uh, uh, a breakthrough, I think it will change the way we access information. And I think for both VRs and AR it could be a really interesting platforms especially in the continuing education space. Um, you know, because we, we always talk about, you know, after we graduate from college, we don't learn the way we learn anymore. You know, we don't learn it in the classroom. We don't have a professor asking us what to do or hand-holding or monitoring our day-to-day -day activity for learning. We don't have that anymore. We, we relying on ourselves. And, and the most things that people would do will probably read newspaper or read a blog online. But... Um, there is no specific standard, but if all this technology hurdles were lifted, we are able to access the latest information, fact-checked uh, information, right? Mm -hmm. um, there could be, the ARs and VR could be a very, very interesting way of, about self-learning. And, you know, to a lot of great work that Andrea is doing already, uh, but find a way to distribute to them and create an incentive or motivations in all of us that we need to continue learn. I think that is really sort of the crucial element to your questions. And people has to aware that they want to learn first before any learning could happen. I I have two two answers. I think <laughs> the first one for the first one I want to speak to my earlier point that um, I don't think VR or any other technological solution should be thought of as completely replacing something else. If there are some examples where that was the case, for example, in architecture, we don't hand draft anymore. We use the computers, but we still sketch certain things by hand. Um, but I generally believe in what I said earlier that the best solution is going to be a combination of things. And that also um, speak to what Kyle said earlier about the pyramid that I showed that you get the, get the best results when you actually have a combination of seeing something, hearing something, doing something and feeling something with your hands and so on. So, um, so this, this idea has led um, into an interest I've started to have lately into this, this idea called multimodality. So multimodality are processes and ways of reaching a certain result that involves the use of multiple media. Um, so I think we have a chance of building the kind of resilience you were hinting at Harvey in responding to crisis situations. If we get more comfortable and get into the mindset of um, combining different methods and different approaches and mastering as many different mediums as possible and techniques as possible. So we are quicker in recognizing, recognizing what so, when something doesn't work and then jumping into something else that allows us to attack a problem from a slightly different angle with slightly different affordances. And the so I think VR specifically, I don't know how it's gonna help. I don't think there's a VR app that you're gonna jump into and, and help you with, with things like a crisis such as what we're going through right now. Um, but the mindset of, 
of bringing to the table as many different technologies as possible and having teams that where each member is a specialist in a different kind of thing, um, it's going to be the way forward. And my second point is the fact that it's not enough anymore to rely on the idea of a multidisciplinary team, which is what I just said. Um, I also am a strong believer that kids and actually everyone should get a basic training in a computer programming language and have basic training in just technology and know how to operate a computer and know how to open a console window beyond just like words. Um, and I'm also a big believer that architects should be taught how to code in architecture school and this beyond just how to create certain kind of visual styles. Um, and Kyle mentioned earlier that some of some of the students are just not interested in learning how to code. Um, I think we need to change that. I think all small kids <laughs> should be introduced to some degree to, to this. They don't have to become coders. I'm not saying everyone should be a programmer, absolutely not. But they should have a basic exposure to that. Because if there's one direction that we're going in that no one is going to argue with is that everything is becoming more and more digitized. Like we're digitizing everything and their mother, right? We're doing every aspect of our lives has become an app in the last 10 years. And it's going more and more in that direction. So having even six months of, of coding experience and understanding like what a coding architecture means, um, it's going to change the way you see the world. And I, if there's one thing I want people to take away from my presence here today is this. You're going to start to understand how certain things are done, why certain software look the way they look, or they do one thing and not the other thing that you really want them to do. Um, because there are a lot of decisions that are determined by limitations and by the structure of, of this technology, digital world and programming languages. So it's gonna, it's just gonna change the way you see everything, um, even if you don't become a professional programmer. All right. Well, I guess this is question is, uh, is it's really op too open-ended, but then I think, um, um, we could do something about it. And, and I really look forward to uh, see how, how schools and companies will adopt uh, the VR technology in the, you know, in the coming few years. I think there, there would be a big change personally. So I think we should wrap up here. And uh, I really want to thank both of you once again. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks, Kyle. And I uh, thank um, everyone who's still here or who joined earlier. And please, um, if you're still here, um, do me a favor. Please um, spend a minute to fill up the, the Google form. The link is in the YouTube page and uh, it'll help us to uh, host a better event next time. So thanks a lot. Oh, I really wish we can uh, kind of hang out in VR space and you know, have a drink or something. <laughs> So anyhow, um, thank you so much. I guess um, we, the session will end here. Thank you. Can I taste thank your you drink? <laughs> we should order the same drink. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good evening. <laughs> thank you. Have a good day, Kyle. Good afternoon, Andrea. Bye. bye bye, Andrea. Bye. Bye, Harvey. Bye, bye. Bye. bye.